Why is kinship important? No doubt there are many reasons, and it seems that among the reasons is that kinship delineates the smallest, most basic units of social organisation, and I imagine that kinship structures might be emulated or paralleled in larger political structures. The first point of kinship delineating the smallest, most basic unit of social organisation is important to an individual because it shapes how that individual conceptualises themselves in society, and provides the individual with an easy metric to indicate who is important, and dictates whom the individual can and cannot form intimate relationships with. Central to most ideas of kinship is the idea of marriage, an arrangement where usually two people decide to intertwine their lives, share resources, and often have children. Sometimes more than two individuals will be members of a marriage, often either as polygyny or polyandry. But I shan't be talking about these systems today. Rather, I'll be describing the Bjarkumi kinship structure and its consequences on other aspects of Bjarkumi culture. To start with, the kinship structure is pretty unusual. Multiple individuals can be married together in a form of plural marriage called a line, or endonymically a mantab. Conventional kinship diagrams are not very apt here, so let me explain this one. Let's suppose our marriage has five members who are grouped centrally in the dashed cartouche. Three males, represented by triangles, and two females, represented by circles. Moving down the diagram indicates moving forward through time, so we can see that this line began with charcoal and sienna having started the marriage, joined subsequently by scarlet, then ochre, then sand. This doesn't tell you anything about the ages of the members, mind you, only the time that they joined the line relative to when others joined the line. It is common that a mantob will persist beyond the lifetime of any of its individual members, because new members can always marry into it, and not only augment the current number of members, but replace members who die. So, if you are describing a mantob and want to include those who have passed away, you can add a box around those members for precision. Children are not considered part of a mantob, but a product of it. Like how milk is the product of a cow, and milk is clearly closely related to a cow, but milk is not itself a cow. As such, they are drawn outside the cartouche containing the Monthob members, and they are drawn at the level where the makeup of the Monthob matches what the makeup was when they were born. Here we can see Teal was born before Sand joined the Monthob, while Fern was born after Sand joined. Each child also has a line drawn to its birth mother, like so. Now, let's go through some kinship terms as though you were in Teal's position. You know who your birth mother is, Sienna, and you call her Ma. By elimination, all other females in the Mantab are not your birth mother, and thus are grouped together and called Na, here being Okka alone. Now, within a Mantab, all members can be sexual partners with one another. Note that this doesn't mean everyone's having sex with everyone else all the time, like a Saturnalian orgy, it just means that it is allowed. As such, seeing as the system came about long before genetic testing, it would be impossible to have absolute certainty as to who your biological father is. So all male members of a mantab you are born into would be called Baba. In the present case, that's Charcoal and Scarlet. However, if a male joins the mantab after you're born, you know with reasonable certainty he's not your biological father, so you call him and all subsequent males Tata, which in the present family is Sand. All members of a mantab taken together from the point of view of a child of that mantab are called Buntba'ul. Your siblings, born of the mantab, will be called Luru, which here is only Fern. It is worth mentioning at this point that because a mantab can be indefinitely long-lived, you will have lots of dead Nas and Tatas and Lurus from earlier on in the mantab's history. As such, children born of the same mantab as you, where none of your potential parents overlap, are called deep siblings, or nguluru, if they predate you, and high siblings, or hyeleru, if they post-date you. The use of deep and high here is because the Byakumi reckoning of time is perceived as flowing upwards, so depth is symbolic of the past, while height is symbolic of the future. Likewise, past and future members of the mantab itself will be prefixed with ngu or hye, yielding nkunna, ngutta, and hyenne, hyatta. So, a quick recap of the basic terms from the point of view of a child of a given mantab with their near English equivalents. Ma means your birth mother, so is equivalent to mother. Na is a non-birth mother, female member of the mantab, so is equivalent to a stepmother or auntie. Baba is any of your potential fathers, which in English would probably just be father. Tata is a non-potential father male 
of the Mantab, which in near English would be stepfather or uncle. Buntapal Ul is all the members of the Mantab together, so that's parents, step parents, aunts, and uncles. And Luru is just sibling, so that could be sibling, brother, or sister. Here I'll jump in with some fun linguistics notes. The word Mantab itself is an accretion and shortening of the four basic kinship terms, Manataba. The word Mantab was then re analyzed as having the root Mantab and got the old human group suffix ul added to it, and with a bit of diachronic sound change that involves some nasal dissimulation and epithesis, we end up with the modern word buntpa'ul for parents. The terms na, tata, baba, and luru have no morphologically distinct singular or plural forms, because it is likely a given person will have one or more of these relations, while ma is default singular and has to be pluralized with a suffix to make male for mothers, and buntpa'ul is default plural and has to be singularized with the suffix buntpa'ul ki to make a parent. But what are the terms from the point of view of a member of a mantha? Well, if you are female like Sienna, you'll call all your male spouses rungu and your female spouses vu'u and them together as rumvu. You'll call your own child teal as kviti and the children of other females in the mantha like fern as suizui. If you are male, like Sand, you'll call all your male spouses Burungu and all female spouses Wu, just like Sienna, and you'll call all your potential children Kviti and all children you couldn't be father to as Suizui. So to recap the basic terms from the point of view of a member of a Mantab with their near English equivalents, we have Burungu, which is for a male spouse, so husband, Wu, which is a female spouse or wife, Umvu, which is spouses, so spouses, husbands or wives, Kviti, meaning potentially your own child, so we would use child, son or daughter, and suizui, not your own child, but still in the family, niece or nephew. The relationships we know as grandparents and aunts and uncles are not so important to the Bjarkuni because each mantab will usually have a range of ages among the Buntpa'ul to fulfill different parental, grandparental and avuncular roles. As such, there are no particular kin terms for them. Rather, a Bjarkimi speaker would describe them concatenatively by saying something like he is the Luru of my Tata, or she is the Ma of my Ma, and so on. Now, I know I said at the beginning of this video I discussed the consequences of the Mantab system, but as it's taken me nearly 10 minutes to merely describe it, I think I'll call it here for this video and address the consequences in another. I thank my patrons, I thank you for watching, and as always, don't like and don't subscribe.